Let me read to you a scripture that is and has been so close to my chest over uh, the past bit. And uh, this is going to be the final message this morning on in this three-part series, Why Suffering Brings Joy. And, uh, you know, I'd originally said I had like eight points or whatever, but really it wasn't, I, I was able to condense those ideas into these three messages, but this will be the final in that. Next week we'll be back in Romans. But let me read this to you. And um, I'll tell you the scripture once I read it, but I just want you to hear it. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer man is wasting away, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. One of the one of the realities of being in Christ, truly, not, not just wearing a Christian badge, but, but one of the things of being in Jesus Christ, in your heart of hearts, is a transformation of the way we think and the way that we see the world. And the longer that you're in it, and the more that you are just breathing in this book and digesting it, the more your thinking becomes otherworldly because it's being formed by, by powers and influences and beings outside of this immediate physical realm that we tend to tie ourselves up in. And, and what happens is, as you're transformed into this new image, and your thinking is conformed to be like that of Christ, then you see circumstances that 10 years before, had you been in the same circumstance, you would not have seen it that way. You, you see them differently, you receive them differently, you process them differently. And one of the calls that I've, that I've brought out over the past couple of weeks is this very strange thing to uh, to an, a non-believer, which is to rejoice literally in your trials, to, to express joy in the midst of your affliction. And you remember the chief implication of that command is that there is a joy within the heart of a Christian, within the spirit, within the person of a person in Christ that cannot be robbed by any affliction. It doesn't matter what it is. The worst that could ever be dealt to a human being, whether it be by the schemes of Satan or the wickedness of man or just the nature of a cursed and fallen world, there's a joy that is so real that it cannot be taken away. That's what it means. To rejoice is to express that joy. And it comes out most profoundly to the world around us when they see that joy being expressed in the midst of a trial. Because if the world is watching you rejoice when everything is going well, there's, there's no basis for them to know what is the real reason for your joy, right? Well, here's this guy who everything's going great. I mean, that's what the devil said about Job. The devil went before the throne of God on behalf of Job. And God said, if you looked at my servant Job, there's no one like him who fears the Lord and shuns evil. The devil said, the only reason that he's like that is because you've built a hedge around his life. Look at him. He has 1,500 head of cattle, multiple homes, tons of children as servants. You take away those things, and he will curse you to your face. This is what the devil said. Now, 
The point there is that when we're expressing joy in the midst of affluency, there's no basis for the world to really see our faith. But when you express it in the midst of a dark hour, then they know the basis of that person's happiness has nothing to do with anything physical in this life. I want to know what that is. You can take anything from any person. You can take a loved one. You can take physical health. You can take any physical thing. This is why Jesus said, don't lay up treasures for yourselves here on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Why would I lay up? Why would I build my everlasting treasury in a place where they'll, they'll rust and they'll be stolen. Why would, I, why would I do that? He said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where there is no rust to destroy. There is no moth to eat them. There will be no thieves to break in and steal what you have. And so you will have it forever. So, this, this scripture, this was the 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 that I read just a moment ago. One of the most profound scriptures for me over the past month. And, and I hope that it grows to be that for you, and maybe it already is. But there are three things that Paul says of affliction that are so strange. And, but when they're exercised and when they're shown, it is the most powerful testimony that you will ever have in your life. When these things, when when a joy is expressed within it because of the truths that are shown about the afflictions. Now, Paul says in this brief couple of verses, he, he mentions three things about affliction. He says three either qualities or uh, or what it's doing about affliction. Number one, he says they are your, that your affliction and my affliction here on this earth is, number one, light. Not uh, sunny, but uh, doesn't weigh very much. Number two, he says they're momentary. And number three, he describes them as having great purpose. So I want to look at those this morning, starting with the first one. This light affliction. Now, what he's saying is, your hardest moment in this life, the darkest hour you face in this life, the worst that you ever come to experience in this life, Paul says, it is light. Now, I want to talk about that. I heard a couple of stories recently that that very much impacted me. First one, there was, uh, and this is recent, there was a group of Christians over in the Middle East who were being uh, persecuted by a militant Islamic group, and the threat was so severe that an agency here in the U.S., a Christian group, was doing somewhat of a covert operation to extract them out of this country. And even as I was hearing the story, they didn't uh, give the details on which country it was, but it was over there. Well, one of the local preachers that lived in this village there, in this country, when, when time came to be extracted, he said, I cannot go. Because if I don't go, who will preach the gospel to these people? From where else will they hear it? And he said it soberly, knowing that it was a very short amount of time before he would be caught and killed. Another group of Christians in the jungle, and again, country wasn't disclosed, but uh, this is recent. Group of Christians. We've, there are Christians all around the world, and we need to know. Uh, we have brothers and sisters 
that are all around the world that are, that are enduring things that in this land we can't even begin to imagine. And <clears throat> they, this group was, was being hunted. And so they had to go into hiding in the jungle. And there was a, <clears throat> a man there who was relaying to another Christian here in the States about what was happening. And he said, my son, who was like a teenager, he said, my son, every single night is sneaking food into these areas to the Christians that are in hiding. He said, you need to understand that it, it's only a matter of time before my son is caught and he will be killed. And, but his, his word about it was, how blessed am I to have such a son as this? I have a f friend um, who's not someone real close, but uh, very much enjoyed our brief time together while we were living abroad. Uh, he came to visit the island where we were living, and he uh, did a lot of mission work to India. And he would go over there for several weeks at a time every year. It was very dear to his heart. Left his family, <clears throat> his grown children, went over there. This was maybe a year ago. And while he was <clears throat> in, in India preaching the gospel, he contracted a, a very severe kind of malaria. And he had to call his wife and his sons from a hospital room there in India to tell them that he wasn't going to make it. So said goodbye to his family, went over to India, and he died on the ground over there because he was there preaching the gospel. The Kovalts recently lost a young man that very dear to them. Sister Kay is grieving the loss of her daughter. Our dear brother Barry is battling cancer. Brother Dave is battling COVID from a hospital room. The visitor policy is not ideal. He's there alone a lot of the time. We see this stuff and Paul says, this is light. And that's the thing that I, I just, how do you say that? I mean, what, do you, how, what do you mean by it being light? And, you know, because it certainly doesn't feel that way. And I know Paul doesn't mean by light that it is easy or that we will breeze through it or that it would be light in comparison to another person next to you who's living a life of ease. He can't mean that because, do you remember, Maybe you don't, but last week, we, one of the, the heart of the message came from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So just three chapters earlier, I want you to hear what Paul said in chapter 1 and verse 8. Writing to the Christians there in Corinth, he said, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. What does he say about this? For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. So, how would you describe that? An affliction that is utterly burdensome beyond all human strength to the degree that Paul's saying we would have rather died. That's how bad it was. And then, three chapters later, this light affliction. Utterly burdensome beyond all human strength. But light. How did those two jive? And, and here's what Paul's point is. His point is to give for us a much-needed perspective in the midst of what we are enduring. And here's, here's how he puts it in verse 17. He says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, did you see the contrast between the word light, this light affliction versus this weight of glory. 
So he's using measurement terms. And then he uses this idea, he says that, they're, that the two are not able to be compared. The difference between this, this affliction, whatever it is that you endure, and the weight of glory, which is to be received, is so grand a difference that there is no earthly way to make a comparison between them. So the idea that Paul is saying is, if you were to take the worst and darkest hours of a human's life and you were to compile them and put them all together into one stack and then you were to place that next to the glory that is to be received for the faithful after this life, the, the glory to be received is so grand that it would dwarf the worst of this life to total insignificance and complete invisibility. That's his point. These sufferings compared to our future glory are so insignificant that side by side, these sufferings would be dwarfed to the degree of invisibility. It would be as a grain of sand compared to the Sahara Desert. Now, that grain of sand may be supremely heavy to the very small bug that's carrying it. Just, as, just an illustration. We, we do not... We need the divine power. We need God. We do not have this strength within us. And so as we endure these things, they may be heavy in that sense, but he's making a comparison that we can't escape. And the, the encouragement is, you, you must know that, yes, it's, it's bad. It can even be to the point that you would despair of life itself. It can be that bad. But Paul is still calling it light, and it's only light in comparison to this other really big thing that he's trying to get us to look at. He's saying, look to that. There will be a degree of glory that is so weighty that when you see it, and when you experience it, and you're in it, there, you will instantly shed all of the grief and forget everything that you endured in this life in order to get to that point. I, let me try to give you a perspective on this, a very feeble attempt. Imagine the most glorious sight you've ever beheld. I, I know that a lot of people speak of the Grand Canyon. I've not been to that canyon. I've seen pictures of it. I've talked to a lot of people who've been there. It's so broad and deep and just massive that it's even hard for the human eye to take it all in. A lot of my family said that it, even, it kind of looked like they were looking at a photograph because they couldn't, they couldn't really process it. Well, <clears throat> that's, that's a degree of glory that we can kind of fathom. Now, my best example is... <clears throat> Many years ago on a backpacking trip up in northern Minnesota in the Boundary Waters, I got up in the, I, I got up in the middle of the night because I needed to pee. So I, I went out of my tent, and I, I looked up. So we were uh, deep into the wilderness, no, nowhere near a town or any civilization. So... Light pollution was a non-issue. There was not a single human light anywhere. The moon was not in the sky either. So I went out and I looked up and I was immediately struck with awe. I've never seen anything like it. The Milky Way until this point was a terrible candy bar <laughs> that you could get from the grocery store. But I'm telling you, the Milky Way was so visible that it looked like a cloud it it was it was packed up with that many stars that it just looked like a white band stretching across the sky and 
honestly, I had to stir up the others from their sleep to come out and see it. It was that great. I just stood there looking at this. And it, was, it's, it is glorious. I mean, the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God. They tell of the glory of God. He's not talking about the heavens that you can see when you're in the middle of a city. He's talking about what it would have been like for anybody living in a time when light wasn't the issue and you could actually see that glory on display. That's a, that's a kind of glory that I can perceive and I can experience right now. But here's the thing. Here's the perspective. Throughout Scripture, the glory of God is described as something that if, if I or you were to look on it with our human eyes, we would die. That's how glorious it is. So I can look at the stars and I don't need to do anything else. I don't need television or anything else. I can just look at them and be totally struck with awe. God is so glorious that if I were to see him now in this form, it would kill me. That's how great it is. What will it be like when you walk through those gates and you see that holy city and the lamb in her midst and we see all of the heavenly hosts gathered around the throne. There are angels that are in heaven that all they do 24-7 is say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they've been doing that for thousands of years. What is it that they're seeing such that they're able to do that thing indefinitely and it's still good? Well, glory. So Paul says, what you face right here and what I face, and we do face some hard things, We've been saying a lot of prayers. We have a lot of love in this church for all the people that are enduring these things. It isn't easy. It is sometimes so utterly burdensome beyond your strength. We're not downplaying that and pretending like that's not true, but we are saying that it is light in comparison to the greatness of what's to come. The heaviest affliction you can have right now is totally insignificant in comparison to the heaviness of the glory that is to come. Number two, they're momentary. I'll tell you a, kind of a personal story. Um, it's a little, at this point in my life, doesn't bother me at all, but, you know, there was a time where it did. Um, when I was coming out of the eighth grade and going into the ninth grade, I had, you know, you kind of, you, you grow up developing your friends. I had been a wrestler, had my group of friends from wrestling, and I was also a skateboarder. Miranda always laughs about that, but um, I was very big into that, and I had a lot of friends that did that as well, and I did this for years. So I was coming out of the eighth grade, going into the ninth grade, and I was a Christian. I had been baptized maybe somewhere around seventh grade, but... Uh, I had a very real faith in Jesus. It was elementary, and it is totally different now. But it was a very real faith in Jesus, such that what I'm about to tell you is true. Uh, I got into uh, high school, and I remember um, finding out that my very best friend, my very best friend had been hiding uh, marijuana in his house. And uh, one day we were driving together. And he was a year older than me, and he had, a, he had a car, and we were driving. And I opened up his little uh, glove compartment or something like that, and this little bag of marijuana rolled out. I was pretty, I, I didn't quite know exactly what it was, but I knew what it was, if you put it, put it that way. And he immediately made something up about it. And um, Well, I came to find out. So I had this group of friends, several of them. I came to find out that all of them had gotten into drugs. And this is, this is progressing. And I made a decision that I was not going to be friends with them any longer. So going into high school, I completely, in, in, in one fell swoop, I lost all of my friend group. And I'll just tell you that it's, it's kind of hard to go into high school and just all of a sudden have a bunch of friends. 
Ninth and 10th grade, my parents will tell you, I don't think I had a single earthly friend. Not until 11th grade, God gave me some really good people. Ninth and 10th grade, Friday night, I was at home with my family. And I remember my mom would always say this thing, this too shall pass. It's, it's only for a time. It's, was it in affliction? Yes. You, what ninth grader doesn't want to have friends? Was it worth it? There will not be a day in eternity that I'm not thankful for having made that choice. It is only for a time. Paul says it is light and it is momentary. And that is in contrast with this eternal weight of glory. Now, here's the thing about this. I, the more I think on this, so it's not like it's just eternal glory, but Paul says that it's an eternal weight. In other words, for all eternity, when we get where we're going, glory is going to be heavy. So for all eternity, it is going to have that same awe-inspiring, majestic, consuming, totally fulfilling uh, quality that it did at the moment that you first saw it. It won't be like something that grows old or that waxes and wanes. It, he's saying that it will be forever the same, which means that you and I in three million years, if we can even begin to conceive that amount of time, what we're experiencing then will be no less awesome, literally, in the, in, not, in the word, not in the way we use awesome, but awe, like it brings you to awe. Awesome, three million years in, as it would have been at the very beginning. This momentary affliction versus an eternal <clears throat> weight of glory. Now, here's what we must do. This is what I do all the time, and it's something that I would advise that you all do all the time, and I think it's one of the most important things that we can do in this life in order to keep, uh, really to, to keep a proper focus is to keep a proper perspective of everything that we do. So if you're going to go do something, or if you're going to behave in a way, or if you're going to make a decision for your life, it needs to be factoring in these perspectives that we know in Jesus Christ to be true. One of them being this. This is what I tell myself all the time. There is right now in Jesus Christ, absolutely, most assuredly, because of and by virtue of being a Christian, and, and that alone, just because of being a Christian and having a faith in Christ, there is a temporary affliction that we will experience, and it could possibly get bad. The, the way that this country is going, it could, I, I would be surprised, actually, if it didn't get bad. And we have to be ready for it. But th that's, there is this temporary affliction here on this earth, but... This temporary affliction, as bad as it gets, will never be anywhere near as bad as hell. And after having lived it, there will be an eternity of glory and paradise and comfort to follow. Versus the alternative, which is to live a life of comfort and ease right now, that is nowhere near as glorious and comfortable as heaven will be, but it is only for a moment, and when it is done, if that was the choice that was made, there will be eternal gloom to follow. So temporary discomfort, not as bad as hell, eternal glory to follow, or temporary pleasure, which pales in comparison to what heaven will bring. And it's only temporary, and afterwards, gloom to follow. Do you see? There's just no contest, is there? Is there any contest at all? No. This perspective has to be had. We have to keep it close to us, which is why the Hebrew writer said we need to be looking to Jesus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And he's now seated at the right hand of God. Why, why was Jesus able to endure the cross, which is the harshest affliction anybody ever faced? How could he do it? For the joy that was set before him, where was his mind? 
Where was he putting his mind every day? What was he looking to? He wasn't getting caught up in his bank account and his work and things that are otherwise okay. He wasn't getting caught up in his friend groups and the distractions of this world. He was looking forward to the joy that was set before him, and that's how he endured it. That is what we are to be looking forward to. That's Paul's point here. He's saying our, our inner self is being renewed day by day as we look forward to that which is to come, as we look forward to that eternal weight which is to come. Now lastly, so it's, temper, it's, it's light, it's temporary. Lastly, imagine if it were only light and temporary, but it was completely unnecessary. Imagine if, imagine if you could live this life and whether you had this light momentary affliction or not, your eternal outcome would be the same. So say, say you walk this life and you have no light, you have no afflictions at all, and at the end of the road, you're still going to live in eternity. All right? So in other words, the affliction itself was unnecessary because it didn't do anything for you. It's light, momentary, unnecessary. I think that you might have uh, something you could say to God in, in terms of why would, I, why would you allow me or permit me to endure it when you knew that it wouldn't make any difference at all for my eternity? Well, Paul doesn't stop at it being light and momentary, does he? What does he say? Read the verse again. This light momentary affliction, literally is what it, here's what it says. This light momentary affliction is working together for us in eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So this affliction that Paul calls light, though it is burdensome beyond all human strength at times, and this affliction that is momentary, Paul says that it is doing something. It's actually doing something. This suffering that you're enduring right now is doing something. And Paul says that it's doing something that's incomparably good for your future. It is actually the mechanism and the means that is working together for us eternal glory. Paul is saying that this is something that is necessary in order to pass through this life and receive the next life. Now, if, if that's true... And as you go through this, here's, here's the problem. Here's, here's why we don't often see it that way. What does Paul say we're to not look at versus what we are to look at? He says, it is producing for you, it is working together for you in eternal weight of glory as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. The only way that it will have this effect of producing this future glory is if in the midst of it, we're not looking just at what can be seen. Because if you're only looking at the, the particulars of the affliction, whatever that might be, the physical pain, the emotional grief, the rejection from men, the persecution, whatever the, the weighed down feeling that you have, um, the, you know, the grief of loss, if, if the only thing that we choose to look at within it is all of those things that everybody can, be, can see, Paul is saying that it won't, it won't be working that for you because what's going to happen is if all you do is look and if, if all I do is look in my affliction at the bad things of it, what will happen to my faith? What happens so often to our faith? What did Jesus say happened to that, that a seed that sprouted up and it grew a plant, but then there was all these other plants that came around it? What happened to it? The, the worries and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, what did they do to it? They choked, they choked it out so that it couldn't produce any fruit. That Jesus is talking about the person who's in, who's because everybody's going to have thorns around them in their life. But it's a matter of what am I choosing to look at? You are producing, you are having produced for you an eternal weight of glory in the midst of suffering. If in the midst of suffering, you're choosing not to look to the things that are seen, but you're choosing to look to the things that are unseen. 
And that's how it's going to do this. So he, I'm suffering right now. No, I'm not saying me. I'm just using this as an illustration. Say I'm suffering right now. How do I do what Paul's asking me to do? Well, I, I stop and I ask myself with joy, how might God be using this terrible circumstance and this very hard hour to produce for me or my family eternal life? How, what might God, who's sovereign, who, who works everything together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, what might he in eternity see that I do not see that he right now is working for my eternal good by means of this thing that temporarily is bad for me? That's, that's what we must do. We must say, I, I hate this. Over the past month as we watched our little girl nearly die, we had to say, what might God be doing right now? for our eternity or for the eternity of others that are witnessing. What might he be doing? Because I do know that in Jesus Christ, he will work everything, even the things that I do not like or want, for my eternal good. Looking not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. And so what's going to happen is, as Paul is saying, this affliction that you're facing it is working together. We must trust this promise. It is this, whatever you're facing this morning. And I, I have been praying for so many in this room. <clears throat> there are so many that are being afflicted, right? We feel it as a church. When one part of the body grieves, everybody grieves. We feel this as a church. But here's the promise. The promise is that if you remain faithful to Christ, that will be the means of something eternally good. And so practically what that means is that you, you are going to stand face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are going to look on his face one day and, and out of nowhere, it's going to hit you and, and you're going to say, do you, do you mean to tell me that the reason why you gave me Parkinson's, this terrible, awful, debilitating, crippling disease, is because you wanted me and my life to stop focusing all of my efforts and energies on the outer man that is wasting away with or without a medical disease? And you saw from heaven that that's what all of my energies and all of my focus was on was this outer man? And you wanted for me to focus in another realm by taking away anything that I could be doing to focus on that outer person? Isn't, isn't that exactly what Paul was saying happened with him when God gave to him a thorn in his flesh? He gave him a physical ailment that hurt him and that was debilitating and that remained with him all life long. He said, I pled with the Lord three times that he take it away from me. And he said, no, I won't take it away from you because my power is made perfect in weakness. God, we, we sometimes have our greatest spiritual strides when the body is taken out of the picture and we're left to be totally humbled before his throne knowing I cannot do it. <clears throat> I just know that this is exactly why our dear friend, my dear friend, uh, family friend, Dave Van Gilder, um, is now living in paradise because Dave was a worldly man left the faith, went to live a reckless and wild life, and one foggy Minnesota morning, I was driving down the interstate in the middle of winter and <clears throat> was going the speed limit and did not see that just right in front of him was a semi-truck parked right in the middle of the highway. He took his car and went straight underneath that semi at 70 Inst instant paralysis. 
Nobody wants that for their life. But I'm certain now today he is thanking the Lord for it. And here's why. That was the moment, the defining moment, where Dave gave his life back to Christ. He reached out to my father, who's a preacher up there, right after it happened. And he never left again. He lived faithfully until he died of a, a different issue later on in his life. So he lived his last 20 years paralyzed, but faithful to Christ, and now he has a body, or he, that's a different subject for a different time, the body's still in the grave, right? But it, it will be raised up. Right now, he is a real person in the presence of Jesus in paradise right now. It's just not the full culmination we're going to get one day. But he's there right now because of that. So what might God be doing for my eternal good? That's Paul's point. He's saying, that's why I rejoice in it. That's why I find joy in it. And an important distinction to make is it's not necessarily because we don't want to start going around and seeing that somebody's suffering physically and immediately just make the assumption that Job's friends made, that this meant that they were somehow unrighteous and God was trying to get their attention. Because the whole point of Job was that Job himself was still righteous. In fact, all the way through it, he did not sin. But why did God do it? Because Job's life of maintaining his righteousness, irrespective of what was happening to him physically, was the greatest testimony that can ever be lived. And and it's basically to say, no matter what this life gives, how bad it is, Job lost all of his family, all of his wealth, everything, even his health, in a matter of days. And Job said, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The whole point of the book is God is worthy to be worshiped irrespective of what this life might bring. And that testimony stands forever. So it isn't just that God uses these moments to teach us personal lessons. He might and he often does. But sometimes God will use a person of faith to be that example within it in order to get the attention of the people around them so that they'll see there's something legitimate and real to this faith. I have no idea how long I've preached, but I feel like it's been a very long one. <laughs> Thank you guys for staying with me. This is, there's just nothing more important. The Super Bowl is today. We're going to watch it, but who cares? Right? Who cares? Somebody just beat us to Snyder's. <laughs> who cares? Because these are the truths that if we keep closely to us, all of us, we will be together in glory forever, thankful that this is where we spent our time. God is a good God, worthy to be praised. Whatever you're enduring, put your trust in Christ. And in that case, he will use it for your eternal good. Let's stand and let's praise him.